Uh, I, I did some groups, so I think the, the first ones are more in the personal area. Uh, Chuck is asking, so now you're retired, so congratulations, by the way. <laughs> and she's asking, if, what are you planning to do? Are you planning to do some cool things with Python, or are you trying to look for more space in, in other things in your, in your life? Uh, well, actually, both. Uh, I am very much enjoying retirement as an opportunity to spend more time outside hiking and biking a lot with my wife. Uh, we live in a beautiful area within uh, half an hour or an hour's drive are all sorts of uh, beautiful places that I love to visit. Uh, if you find me on Instagram, you can see where I went lately. Uh, but uh, at other times, I also uh, like to keep my mind sharp by uh, working on new ideas for Python. Uh, you have already seen probably the <coughs> new parser that I introduced with uh, uh, Okay, I didn't prepare this. Anyway, the new parser was introduced in Python 3.9. Uh, and uh, currently I'm working uh, with a few other people again on uh, uh, a match statement, which, which is proving somewhat controversial, but uh, I think it will in the end uh, turn out to be a very useful addition to Python. Okay, nice. Looking forward to see that. Um, so next question is, okay, what other language, what other pro programming language do you like to use? Uh, that's, that's tough because I really don't like any other languages anymore. Uh, <laughs> the only sense, other right? language in, in, in the past few years, I think the only other language that I've used is pretty much uh, C. Uh, and that's only because I'm working on Python internals occasionally, like with a parser, there was a lot of C code for the, the match statement is actually there. There's also a lot of C code, but uh, someone else is uh, maintaining that brand. Uh, yeah, when I still worked at Dropbox, occasionally I saw a little bit of Go or Rust or JavaScript. Uh, not a fan of JavaScript. Uh, probably just because I don't understand the ecosystem anymore. I haven't really kept up with what's going on in JavaScript and mm -hmm. people are now writing incredibly complicated things uh, using React and stuff like that. And I have no understanding of how that works or what you can do with it. Rust seems an interesting language, but I've, I've never ever compiled even Hello World in Rust. I don't think I, I've ever downloaded a Rust compiler anywhere. Uh, same for, for, well, yeah, pretty much the same for Go. Okay, nice. Yeah, so you created your language, so it makes sense that you want to work in a different one. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I can, I can, I can fly in Python <laughs> and in all the other languages. I basically, I can fly in Python and C, and in everything else, I, I have to learn to crawl still. Yeah, okay. So, I, I will merge those two questions, but one person is asking, what was your inspiration to create Python? And then the next question, I, maybe we can put those together, is if you, if you have the opportunity to, to start Python from scratch now, or maybe to go, I don't know, to get all the knowledge that you have now in, when you were starting, what do you think it would be different? So it, it will be, the question is saying, it will be more close to JavaScript? And, it's also asking if you would keep the guild. Uh, everyone is naming the guild, I don't know why. Wow, those are a bunch of very leading questions. Uh, I think I'm gonna separate it all out. Well, the, imp the inspiration for Python was, well, I've, I've written about it a couple of times, I guess. I actually enjoyed working on a language I had sort of helped implement a few years earlier in the early 80s uh, <clears throat> and I was writing a lot of C code at the time in say 80, 88, 89, 90 and I 
felt that I was being unproductive in the type of applications I was writing. So <clears throat> I was looking around for other options uh, and we had a platform that would make it difficult to say do a port of Perl. Although in the end, if I had spent all the time I spent right creating Python, if I had spent that on a good Perl port to that platform, Python would never have uh, occurred. <clears throat> So I would still be living in Amsterdam uh, coding uh, for for money. Sorry, I'm losing my voice, I realize. Uh, <coughs> if, it's okay, take your time, it's okay. If I <laughs> yeah, if I had to start over in 2020, that is one of those crazy hypotheticals that <laughs> I, I don't know what to do with. Uh, <coughs> Because if there was no Python in 2020, there was certainly something else. And so, I don't know, I, I, I can't trans, translate the mindset that made me create Python in 1990 to 30 years later and, and come up with a sensible, sensible answer. If you're saying, would it be more like JavaScript? I, I hope not. But I mean, it, it's, it, I don't know. It's, it's like, what if I was born rich instead of poor? Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that, that's, that's, that that's unanswerable. And, and there, was a, there was some mention of, I think, uh, the gill and one mm -hmm. other specific thing. That was only the gill. So if you will maintain that. So I, I will rephrase that question. Let's say you have 128 bytes in a message to send to yourself in 1991 <laughs> what would be your advice for for starting python at that time uh it's a small message i know <laughs> i think I, I i i will refuse to send that message because i feel that anything i could say uh would would sort of through the butterfly effect would change the world so much even 128 bytes that I would be very worried for a completely different outcome. And I, I, I can't imagine what I would have to say to make the outcome better because I would, if I, I, if I received the message from myself 30 years in the future saying, uh, what you're doing is great and it's gonna be the most popular language in the world or something like that, I, I don't think I would have been able to handle that. Plus, of course, it's 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 it, again, it's 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 a nonsensical mm -hmm. question. So, at, I don't know. Just ask something else. <laughs> Next yes, question, yes. please. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, a lot of people was asking the same. So, uh, I I will I will I will tell you three or maybe put two together. But basically, the question is if you imagine Python running in the web. So as a, as, as a JavaScript is running now in the browsers. So some, Her, Harald was asking if, for example, uh, is that support to Brighton? Is something that is in the plans of the of Python? Or, or if you think the Python can be a front end uh, web development language? There was like a lot of questions, like yeah, four or five yeah. of that. Uh, that, that has, passed my mind a few times in the last three decades. Uh, but every time I considered it, JavaScript was a different language. Like I think the first time I thought about this and people actually built this, believe it or not, in 1995, uh, there was a plugin that worked in both existing web browsers at the time. Uh, my, some early version of Microsoft Explorer as well as Netscape, I believe. And there was a plugin that you could use to run Python in the browser. Uh, nobody even remembers that because it, plugins, it turns out plugins were a dead end in, in the world of browsers. Uh, and this was actually, I think that the plugin here was similar to running Java in the browser rather than running JavaScript in the browser. But nevertheless, you, you could send a whole program to the browser. The problem was that 
end users would have to install the plugin because there was no automatic or easy mechanism to install plugins. Plus it was of course entirely un insecure. So smart end users probably wouldn't want to plug that in to, to install that plugin. And then uh, a website developer of course would think twice before they decided to use that plugin for their website because nobody could look at their website without installing the plugin. If, more recently, you may remember something called Flash, uh, which was also a plugin you had to install. For, for decades, websites that, that were built on Flash would sort of be sort of, there would always be places where they wouldn't run and there would be big buttons uh, that say install Flash and uh, yet half the world would not be able to install Flash until the browsers just came with Flash pre-installed and then became a huge security vector. Uh, so that was, was the whole plugin model, I'm, I'm glad is, is sort of gone from the world. The, the last time I saw a website that said your Flash is out of date or you're not running Flash was, was five years ago, I believe. Uh, yeah, so then we, we, we got to the time when uh, JavaScript embedded in HTML to make sort of things like active buttons and a few other things became popular. And so you would have mostly HTML and there would be like a script section in there or there would be little snippets of JavaScript sprinkled through the page and you would have some, some kind of dynamic activity in the browser. And I looked at that and I thought, well, could Python do the same? Uh, it probably could be made to do the same. There was a problem in that particular model that embedded Python code, like a small snippet of Python, as long as it's more than a single expression. If it, if it can be a statement, you're, you're getting in trouble with the indentation. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if people had actually uh, implemented systems like that, because uh, as far as I recall, uh, web standards actually supported other languages than JavaScript to be specified, but of course there were no browsers that, that sort of fully supported any, anything besides JavaScript. Uh, the latest incarnation is, is actually the most likely one to eventually yield some kind of success, which is uh, the browser has an execution engine. Uh, we can translate any language we want to code that runs on that execution engine. Uh, the original version of that was uh, just transpile anything you want to JavaScript. Doesn't matter how ugly the JavaScript looks because you're never gonna have to look at it. Uh, and now you can do everything on the web, on the server side. And so you don't have the problem that users have to install anything new in their browser. Uh, that could be done. I believe that, that some of, I, I actually have no idea how Brighton works, but I imagine there are some, some things like Brighton that, that work that way. Uh, <clears throat> a more recent refinement of the same idea is uh, WebAssembly, W-A-S-M, uh, which I don't know that much about, but it sounds again like something where we could relatively easily, and probably someone already has done it as a master's project or maybe a summer of code at Mozilla, who knows? Just trans, transpile, compile Python to WebAssembly and run that in the browser. Uh, you can probably, if, if, if you want to be crazy, you can transpile C code into WebAssembly and just take all of C Python and run that in the browser. I, I don't know how well that would run because it would be a very large upload or download the first time you want to run it. Uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, it has some advantages of sort of being more faithful to exact Python semantics. Uh, 
all these sound sound interesting approaches and it's possible that at some point something like Brython or another similar approach uh, will be successful. Uh, I think it's too soon to tell. I don't know that it's necessarily the sort of the core Python team's uh, task to look into this. Uh, this is something that anyone with, with sort of good knowledge of the target platform, namely a browser running WebAssembly or a browser, browser running a modern JavaScript engine uh, can figure out how to, how to do. Okay, nice, thank you. Yeah, well, Summer looks super interesting. Um, okay, let me move to the next question. We, we have a lot of live, I'm, I'm going to wait a few minutes for that. Um, Ram is asking for, if you can share your feelings about the PEP 622, the pattern matching PEP. Uh, sharing feelings, oh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm not I'm not all that that great at sharing feelings. My my current feelings around that pep are in part a sense of relief that most of the the hard work of designing and even implementing uh, pattern matching and sort of looking at all the possible ways that it can be implemented and looking at all the use cases and sort of looking at how it is best told and how to how to solve all the various constraints of making it sort of pythonic and making it sort of powerful enough and making it useful we've we've sort of done all the work and that's behind us uh more recently, I was really upset by a lot of feedback that that came uh, from the core dev community <coughs> about that pep. Uh, it was not fun to to sort of see threads with the subject the anti pep. Should we perhaps have a way to write a pep? that explains why a certain other PEP should not be accepted. And it was very clear what, what this was about. And other people that are very smart and whom I respect tremendously, sort of putting all their effort into sort of tackling this new, I, new proposal and explaining why it is unpythonic and a bad idea and should not be done with them. And, and all in, as far as I can tell, very sort of subjective emotional uh, ways <clears throat> where it's, it's, it's hard to reason when one person's position is, this is easy to teach and another person's position is everybody's going to be confused by this because we, we just don't have data to, to decide an argument like that. And it, so what you, what you get is you, that sort of the person who shouts the loudest uh, gets the biggest audience. And that sort of, I don't know, I, <clears throat> I feel I still have a pretty decent intuition about what sort of what kind of language features fit well into Python and are are generally useful and how to use them and how to design them and so I I sometimes just feel personally attacked when when people who who I see as clearly less experienced in language design and sometimes like utterly failing in language design come up with counter proposals that are so poorly thought out that that I don't even know how to respond to it except by saying this can never work. Okay. So I'm and and it's it's so the pep is currently in the stage where uh, I sent it off to the steering council and the steering council has been very busy because they've been distracted by some other topics 
uh, but hopefully in the next few weeks, they will have uh, some time to think about this and how they uh, want to review it. Possibly, I mean, for me, the best possible outcome would be for the steering council to pick some developer who is somewhat friendly to this proposal uh, uh, to sort of decide where, review the PEP and decide where it needs more work and uh, whether certain design decisions that are are not set in stone can need need to be uh, changed, but it's possible that the steering council decides that this is just too big of a change and they don't want to uh, get burned by approving it. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. There was two different persons asking almost the same, so I would pick one. Um, so the question says, we've grown language support for even loops in the past decade, like uh, it was a really good progress, it's still in progress. And the question is, where do you feel the Python language stands in regards to concurrency primitives? And what area do you see the language moving? More towards Go with the subinterpreters? or more towards the async await uh, place. So, and, and, and there was two different persons asking almost the same, like two interpreters mm -hmm. or <coughs> versus async. Uh, <coughs> to be honest, I don't think that sub interpreters solve the problem with concurrency uh, because they, they only solve it by placing complete, a complete barrier between each sub-interpreter. So there, there, there is not much gain to be made between, uh, compared to uh, just forking multiple processes. Uh, and in a sense, sub-interpreters are less robust because if one sub-interpreter experiences a hard crash, uh, the entire group of sub-interpreters running in the same process will necessarily have to be terminated. Uh, while if you have a number of processes that are all working on a problem in parallel, if one of the processes fails, uh, the other processes, if you've designed things right, can uh, continue and you can just restart the process. So I, I don't know that sub sub processes are really solving the right problem. They they are definitely solving some problems, but the problems are not so much in in uh, concurrency. I feel they they are more about uh, larger applications embedding Python and sort of being able to have independent Python interpreters for for sort of different parts of the embedded application, or maybe there are different libraries that are, are combined together that each have a completely different independent use of Python. But for concurrency, yeah, I'm also not, not optimistic about getting rid of the GIL, uh, at least in the sort of every solution that's been tried and people have been trying for two decades at least, uh, every solution has sort of slowed down the single threaded performance dramatically because you end up having uh, many finer grained locks. Uh, it is possible that a complete redesign of the Python interpreter really from the ground up made for concurrency could sort of have different performance characteristics. Uh, but that would be an enormous task that I think only private capital could fund that. And it's very unclear that that much would come out of that. Okay, okay. So I won't, I'm going to ask the last one from my list because we already have 24 from the public. I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'm not going to ask all of them. So. <laughs> So the last question for my list is uh, Sean Marco from Brazil. He's asking if, if there is a plan or if there is a program to engage, to introduce more people to the core developers team. 
So b b he was saying, uh, we love Python, but Python doesn't fall from the trees. Um, <laughs> we need more people to work there. Uh, so it, what's the plan or what's the program for that? The steering council uh, is very aware that, that we're not attracting new core developers in sufficient numbers. Uh, so I can't speak for the steering council because I'm no longer a member. Uh, but I know that when I was on the steering council last year, that this was also uh, an important topic that we were thinking about. Uh, it's not an easy problem because uh, it's, it's sort of, it's one thing to get people to easily contribute a simple fix for a simple problem. I mean, that's, that's hard enough if you, if you sort of, if you fix a one line bug in some C, C code that's part of C Python, you have to sort of go through a whole number of steps just in order to be able to compile and test your changes. Uh, we have developer guide that, that talks people through that uh, in, in great detail. Uh, it's, it's still not always easy to follow because of course people come into this with such different backgrounds. Some people are very experienced in open source development, just not in the particular workflow that Python uses. Other people are uh, experienced C coders, but they have no idea of how Git, Git works or, uh, I mean, we see a, a fair number of bungled pull requests from beginners uh, who make some classic Git mistake and uh, they, they do a, an incorrect merge and now they have 500 uh, commits in their pull request that shouldn't be there because they didn't write those, pull, th those commits. Uh, and this usually sort of causes uh, 30 different core developers to be auto registered as reviewers. So anyway, the, the, the workflow is difficult, but the, the sort of the other part of the problem, I mean, the workflow can be learned. We can also simplify the workflow to some extent. We can, we, I, I don't think we can really sort of stop people from making basic Git mistakes because there are enough Git tutorials that explain how to do it and people just don't follow the tutorial because Git is so random. Uh, but sort of attracting people who are able to, to sort of take in this large amount of C code and Python code, of course, that is uh, C Python and the standard library. Uh, it's just difficult uh, because you can you can feel very productive by fixing some issues in one module, but that doesn't teach you much about how some other module works. And there is a huge amount of history and a very great concern for backwards compatibility. And you have to sort of be aware of the philosophy of sort of what kind of things are make make sense to add and what things don't like this morning on python ideas there was a little discussion about uh a new variation of the wrapper function uh that would take an extra parameter that basically tells it how much work to do i guess how how large an output to produce and there was immediately debate about whether that was better to it was better to do that as a third party library or whether that was really uh, something that ought to be built into the language. And there were immediately strong opinions on both sides, sides of the argument. So it's, it's just, it's a difficult project. And, and part of that is just because it's a very large mature piece of software uh that has to move carefully and slowly and you have to attract people who who sort of are interested in in working on that that said i mean we we have successfully attracted new developers some with sort of very specific skills uh we've also attracted new core developers who 
don't necessarily want to help out with the C code, but are useful in other areas like documentation or workflow or uh, issue triage. So we we are trying to to get more people involved for sure. Uh, and if you don't always see where to start, maybe part of that is that we're we're looking for people with a certain level of experience. Uh, so that I mean we we can't teach people how to code in in C, for example. So if you can totally be a core dev and not ever touch any any C code, but you still have to sort of know a lot of other stuff and you'll you'll eventually have to work your, your way around the C code. Okay, thank you. Nice. Um, so let's move to the live questions. Uh, first one is easy. Uh, Piro is asking if you ever, if you have ever made the Monty Python curve. <laughs> Sorry, what was the last word? So if if you ever meet the Monty Python crew, so the Monty Python group. Oh. <laughs> Unfortunately, not. I'm a big fan of John Cleese, but I've I've not got come closer than uh, following him on Twitter. Okay. Um, what do you hate most, the most about Python? So what do I hate most about Python? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> nothing comes to mind, sorry. Yeah, yes. no, I... <laughs> So I don't know if I want to ask this question, but it has a lot of balls. Uh, so <laughs> what would you like to introduce to Python 4? And when do you see the switch happening? Uh, well, I think that the general question is, is people are fearsome, fearful about uh, Python 4 because they they remember the Python 3 transition and how we were not prepared and all that. Uh, I, I sort of, I see two things in the future for sure. One is that Python 4 is a long time in the future, if it ever happens, uh, because we're happily planning 3.10 and we can go all the way to 3.99 before we, uh, well, then we can just go to 3.100. So there's, there's no reason to switch to Python 4. Uh, and I know there are a few peps that still mention Python 4 as uh, a possible time frame where, where certain things will change or become the default. That basically means never. Uh, if and when there is a Python 4, whether that is in five or 50 years, uh, my expectation is that we'll, we'll sort of spend an enormous amount of time working on transition strategies that are actually practical for, for real users in the Python community. With Python 3, we sort of, we definitely thought about transition strategies, but we misinterpreted how many Python users there were and what their skill levels were, basically. We thought that everybody thought was, was sort of as interested in making their Python code better as the core developers typically are. So I don't want to have that sort of, that you can look, look up my, my talk about that topic at Pi Cascades a few years ago. Uh, Victor Stinner also gave a nice talk about this topic. So if Python 4 ever happens, if, if there is a reason to, to sort of somehow break backwards back compatibility, there will be a very different approach to sort of how to maintain compatibility. Uh, and it's it's possible that in the end we'll actually declare something Python four for a very minor backwards incompatibility. I mean, it could be that like removing the guild changes semantics of 
multiple threads enough that even without any other explicit API changes, if all the API and everything, all the objects did exactly the same, worked exactly the same as they do in Python 3, if the only difference was that the gill was removed, we might still have to declare it Python 4 because in practice, the gill sort of causes certain performance uh, guarantees, even though you, you may not always like them, but actually in some cases you do like, you will like them. Uh, and it, it will just be sort of tricky for people to, to upgrade. Uh, and so, I, I mean, that's, that's just a random hypothesis. It could, it could be something completely different too. It could be that uh, we're using a different approach for the C API. I mean, there are a couple of new approaches there. There is a basic API uh, that is smaller than the traditional C API. Uh, there's also a handle-based API under development. So maybe at some point we'll declare something Python 4, not because the language has changed, but because the C API has changed. And of course the C API sort of is what what keeps the ecosystem together. So that's that's again not not a a thing to say. Ah, yeah, one or two extension writers have to uh, change their code a little bit, but everyone else is safe. No, it means it 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 would mean that like the entire scientific Python, the entire data science machine learning world would have to uh, produce new wheels at the very least, and probably update their code significantly. So that's, that's, that's like not something we can, we can do in, uh, in five years. That, that takes a decade. Cool. So I, I <laughs> and, and basically I'd say Python 4 is not happening anytime soon. Uh, it's not something to worry about and it's going to feel very different than the Python 3 transition. Okay, thank you. Um, next one. Um, so, people are asking, what's your favorite book? Or maybe you can pick one. I don't know if you have only one favorite book. <laughs> uh, I, I have lots of books that I read and I, I sort of, after I read a book, I forget it again until <clears throat> it I'd sort of until I see it again, maybe. Uh, one book that I've really, really enjoyed reading when it came out, I think well over a decade, was Anathem by Neil Stevenson. Okay. Uh, Neil Stevenson in general is one of my favorite authors uh, <clears throat> and has been for a long time. Uh, I think I've read almost everything that he's written. Uh, and Anathem for me was, was the most fun to read, I think of everything he's written. Okay, thank you for recommending it. Um, I'm going to pick this one. It doesn't have a lot of gold or shot because I'm selecting the questions. So, uh, <laughs> if there is a piano in your teacher or is a piano pattern and if it's maybe that you are learning how to play the piano or is something that you, you are trying to do? Or? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not following. No, the question is, you have a piano uh, pattern in your t-shirt and if, the question if that is a clue of a new hobby that you have, that you are maybe trying to learn. Oh, to oh, my t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. Ah, no. Uh, the t-shirt is actually a secret message. Oh. Uh, this, this t-shirt was uh, printed by Dropbox a few years ago uh, on the occasion of Black History World. And I, I believe that the, the story was to get the t-shirt, you would have to donate $10 to uh, a designated charity. So I uh, donated a bunch of uh, stuff and I got a t-shirt and it said, I'll stand up so you can see the whole thing. Uh, it, it really, it, has very little to do with piano. It's just about sort of different colors and okay. diversity. Cool. 
I'm colorblind, so probably I'm not going to guess the secret. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's not more than that to it. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, we have a few minutes, not a lot. Um, do you think that my pie will become part of a standard library? Ah, uh, yeah, people sort of I have been very hopeful about MyPy. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea, actually. Uh, MyPy is is a piece of code that, like like any other linter, uh, it has a very different development cycle and sort of fixing fixing sort of tying MyPy's uh, development to the that of the standard library would sort of slow down MyPy development tremendously. Uh, so I would I would really much rather keep it separate uh, because otherwise you would basically not be able to get new MyPy features with all Python versions. Uh, it's possible that what people really meant by MyPy is some form of uh, static type checking built into the interpreter. Uh, again, I think that's that's not likely going to happen because the the language as sort of allowed by uh, the type system specified by PEP 484 and uh, the follow on PEPs is actually less powerful than the full dynamic language. And Python is a dynamic language and I think it should always stay a dynamic language and sort of static checking definitely is an important tool that everybody who is writing more than a thousand lines of Python uh, should probably be familiar with and have in their toolkit, but at the same time, uh, it's one of those tools where you, you sort of, you have to be, be able to turn it off or use a different tool or, or sort of, it's, it's use needs to remain truly optional. And if you, if you have a corner of your application where static type checking makes no sense or just slows you down, uh, or maybe uh, the, what, what you're doing is, could be statically typed, but it would require a significant expansion of the static type checking of this, the, the type system that MyPy and other checkers support, that alone would be a good reason to, to sort of be careful here. Uh, there are still, there is a pending PEP 612 uh, and there are probably going to be some follow-up PEPs as well uh, that try to deal with for example, uh, type checking applications that use uh, NumPy arrays uh, where you have operations that sort of require two inputs to have the same size or to have the same size in a certain dimension or to have the same dimensions. There are all sorts of combinations and the current type system cannot exp express that at all. So it's, it's essentially way too early, way too soon to to even try fitting everything in there. Okay, so I think the, di the dynamic side of the language needs to sort of stay ahead of the statically typed set, the subset. Okay, so we are on time now. So I'm going to ask you the last question. I was saving that one, this one for, for the end. So Kanak Kavadi, and I probably mispronouncing that name. So this person is saying, Guido, you are such an inspiration to me and all of us, I'm sure. And what's your message or advice on both life and career for a young developer or a young software engineer like me, you see, Kanak? And I knew that one would be coming and I, I don't have a pat answer to, to sort of that question. It's, it's like, My approach was, and, and you should probably, if you haven't ever read that blog post by me, I, I wrote something called a King's Day speech 
just Google for my name with King's Day speech and Google will certainly find that blog post for you. Uh, that's the most inspirational story I've ever written, I believe. Uh, my approach, and I was incredibly lucky that, that it worked out so well, was uh, uh, make sure you have fun. Do sort of join the project that looks the most interesting and most fun to do uh, and, and sort of prize that over uh, what is perhaps the most lucrative or uh, I don't know, there, there are many different ways that you can evaluate uh, jobs. Uh, if I didn't want to do something, I, I would not do it. If I wanted to do something uh, that other people didn't think I should do, I might still do it. Uh, after all, that's how Python came into being. At the same time, uh, sort of, I've been looking back at my life and I would say I definitely worked too hard. Uh, 30 years of being Python's BDFL uh, have not been great for my family. I've, I've sort of spent every day in the office and then every night I would be spending and, and, and many hours every weekend or most weekends I would be spending uh, still keeping sort of thinking about Python stuff uh, and, and sort of that level of, of taking your work home with you, I don't think is good. So have, have fun, but, but, but make sure to, to sort of let yourself be distracted by other aspects of life besides work. And yeah, so we are on time. So that was all. I, I'm going to play some sounds so you feel like. <laughs> you, you, you feel like.